glad to see that we're, we're, we've, we've just about filled the room. It is the day before vacation, which we hadn't really thought about, but uh, kudos to everyone for joining us again. This is the, I believe, sixth installment now? We have two. Yeah, but I think the sixth installment of Agape Latte. And uh, we're delighted that you could join us. My name is Tim Muldoon. I'm the director of the Church in the 21st Century Center, uh, which co-sponsors this event with Campus Ministry. And uh, uh, I hope that uh, you'll find this an engaging conversation. Hope that you'll think of some great questions as our uh, speaker uh, goes on. Uh, before I introduce her, I just want to mention a couple of very brief announcements in no particular order. Uh, one is a pitch for... Uh, the next big event that C21 will be hosting. So I will mention it now, but, but some of you have already checked your, your email inboxes and, and know what I'm talking about. Monday, April 23rd, Conti Forum, 7 to 8.30 p.m., Tim Russert, Senator Sam Brownback of Kansas, Senator Chris Dodd of Connecticut. They're both presidential candidates, and they're going to be speaking about the way that they perceive the relationship between their faith as Catholics and the way that they operate as people engaged in public life. So uh, any of you who were around last year and uh, saw the event with, uh, that, that, that uh, Tim Russert hosted knows that it's a very engaging uh, evening of, of conversation, and he's, of course, a great interviewer. So mark your calendars again, Monday, April 23rd. It's going to be here before you know it because you're going to go away for Easter, and then suddenly you know, you're back, and so I'm telling you now, uh, the, the, the tickets will be available uh, through the C21 website. And again, there'll be lots of publicity, so just be aware of that. Um, the other thing that I'll mention is that the next uh, installment of Agape Latte is on uh, Tuesday. I believe it's May 1st. It's the first uh, Tuesday of May. Um, and the speaker for that evening will be Ken Himes, who is the chair of the theology department here at BC. Um, who writes extensively on social justice, you'll love it. Come on back, bring your friends. It'll be a great evening. Uh, two other uh, brief um, announcements. We've got uh, the first of what we hope is going to develop into a series of conversations on your very own cable channel 46 here on campus. Now, a lot of you may not know this, but, but BC has its very own cable channel, channel 46. So if you're surfing late at night, um, you'll see maybe some of your classmates um, on this program. In fact, a couple of them are, are here in this room, uh, and I won't ask them to uh, identify themselves because they'll feel embarrassed. But uh, we're hoping that this will develop into an ongoing series of conversations around um, issues related to um, faith, um, the church, um, lives of students, etc. And uh, we'd love your feedback, so, so watch for that. It's called C21 in Dialogue, again, cable channel 46. The last thing I'll mention, and, and we've mentioned it a couple times, is that we are um, still in the process of um, inviting uh, the contribution of people like yourselves to be part of a student group that advises us on things like this. And uh, we've, we've been a little slow in getting a response, but those of you who have expressed interest, stay tuned. Those of you who are interested, please let me know. Uh, you can talk to me later today, or you can contact me uh, by email, again, through the C21 Center. So. All that aside, now I will turn to uh, introduce our speaker, who is a member of the philosophy department here at BC, Dr. Marina McCoy. We're thrilled that she could join us. Um, she, I think, is going to uh, just be a fascinating um, speaker this evening. We've talked a little bit about uh, her story, and uh, you've seen the title for this, but um, I'll, I'll let her give the details. I'll just tell you the, the sort of you know, basic stuff that, that you should know about her. Namely, that uh, she did her uh, BA at Earlham College and uh, did her um, uh, graduate work at, at BU in philosophy and has just finished a book that will be released by the very prestigious uh, Cambridge University Press uh, on Plato. So she's, um, she, she's very intelligent, among other things, um, and a very engaging speaker. So we're delighted that she could join us. So without further ado, let her turn on her lavalier. Uh, Dr. Marina McCoy. Hi, thanks for coming out uh, on Holy Week and right before vacation time. I appreciate your being here. Um, I'm a convert, and Tim asked me to speak about being a convert. Um, that in itself is always kind of a curiosity to people, I think. Uh, usually when I tell people I'm a convert, I tend to get one of two responses. Either if they're cradle Catholics, they'll say something like, oh, really? Like, you chose that for yourself because... 
Um, from what I can tell, cradle Catholics have the great privilege of uh, sort of regarding their Catholicism as something you don't choose. It's just part of who you are. Uh, not loud enough. All right. Shall I start over? <laughs> All right. So, so uh, you know, it's, it's like a sibling or something, right? If you're a person who was born in the Catholic faith, raised in the Catholic faith, you might love your sibling, you might hate your sibling, but you don't choose your sibling, right? You just are a Catholic. Um, or if I tell other converts I'm a convert, people they get really excited, you know, um, because converts love to, love to share their stories about being converts. So if you get a group of converts together, if you got a group of us up here, you'd never leave tonight. We'd be talking the whole time, and you wouldn't be able to go home and do anything else. So, um, but in some ways, the term con uh, being a convert can can be a little bit of a misnomer. Um, I did put that in the title when Tim asked me what what I was going to talk about, but. I mean, technically, when I talk about my journey of faith and uh, moving from a Protestant church to a Catholic church, which is the heart of my talk, that's really a relatively minor part of what I would consider conversion. Um, I think conversion is really a lifelong experience, a lifelong experience, a move, uh, hopefully, of God uh, bringing each one of us closer to him. The other thing I guess I want to say about conversion uh, is that, from my point of view, it's really about a greater movement of freedom. Uh, people don't often associate Catholicism and freedom in the same sentence, right? Uh, there's a tendency to think about someone becoming Catholic as, you know, willingly taking on maybe more restrictions um, or moving towards a uh, denomination that people often associate with having a lot of requirements. Um, so I'm one of few people who gets really excited that I don't, you know, eat a lot of food on Good Friday. <laughs> um, most people, of course, uh, might see that as onerous or whatever. I may perhaps not, but I, um, as, again, converts tend to get kind of excited about these rituals and stuff they didn't necessarily grow up with. Uh, I don't really want to emphasize that, though. I think that more important than emphasizing denomination or emphasizing requirements or uh, things that one is supposed to do, I really want to emphasize what my experience has been, which is that um, for me, becoming Catholic has been a way of experiencing greater freedom. And so I want to emphasize that as I give my talk and explain uh, my story to you. Uh, I certainly don't want to emphasize, I mean to say to anyone, that you should all have to go convert and to be, to be Catholic if you're not Catholic. Um, this really is a personal story. And I would never want to say that God's grace can't work through all kinds of faiths and all kinds of life experiences. I'm just here to tell you, you know, what my experience has been and to try to describe um, to the best of my ability, you know, what I can currently see in that situation. And I'm sure my own understanding of my um, conversion will change, you know, as, as I get older and reflect back more on it. So. Uh, I guess I should begin with my childhood. I was raised by completely agnostic parents. Uh, my parents did baptize me when I was little as a baby, Lutheran. They had grown up in a ethnic Latvian church, Latvian Lutheran church, and uh, the variety of Lutheranism that they were raised in was a lot of talk about hellfire and brimstone. Basically, you do enough things wrong or believe the wrong things and you go to hell. So my parents uh, very kindly, I think, uh, intended not to expose me to that and thought that it would be better for me just to be raised without a church. So they didn't take me to church when I was growing up. Um, they themselves had very little interest in religion at the time. And so I always felt like uh, a very religious sensibility nonetheless. Uh, I was the, the kind of kid who was really interested in God. I was interested in spirituality. I had a lot of questions about God from the time I was very young but really didn't have a place or an outlet where I felt like I could talk about those kinds of questions. So that's the kind of little kid who'd like walk up to mom and dad, right, and say, um, so mom, what do you think about the fact there are all these different world religions, and, but there's one God, and what do you think about that? My mom would basically look at me, you know, like I was a creature from outer space or maybe adopted or something, you know, like maybe not uh, her genes or whatever. And um, maybe, you know, why, why do I ask those kinds of questions? And she would sort of say, I don't know. I don't really know. So, um, so it's kind of uh, something that was important for me growing up was kind of trying to find a place where I could express my sense of spirituality and express my faith. It was when I was probably an early adolescent that I first became interested specifically in Christianity um, at, at, at a more uh, deeper level, I guess, as opposed to religion in general or God in a very general sense. I was reading the Gospels. Uh, I'd been to a summer camp, 
again, I think it was a Latvian camp, and a Lutheran minister was there, and I had, I had very, very brief exposure to Christianity through going to the summer camp. And what I decided to do, being a very bookwormy kind of girl who was always reading, was to read the Gospels. So I went home, you know, after summer camp and started reading the Gospels. And in the course of reading them, I felt as though this person of Jesus really spoke to me in a very direct way. So um, it's kind of peculiar because, of course, most people, I think, again, get their religion from like a church or friends or peers or institutions. I, I truly think I began originally to believe in Christianity from like reading the Gospels. Um, and I can't even today explain to you exactly what that was about. Um, I don't think it was particularly an intellectual decision. I think for me it really was an experience, a feeling as though Jesus was reaching to me through reading these books. Um, for a long time I wanted to practice religion, but my parents just didn't have an interest. And again, um, uh, it was not something that they particularly uh, were against, but they sort of didn't have uh, anything of their own life experience where they wanted to uh, bring me to church or uh, raise me in a particular faith either. So it really wasn't until I was about 18 that I decided to join a church. And I joined the uh, denomination Disciples of Christ out in the Midwest. Disciples of Christ, if you don't know, is a lot like the UCC kind of of the Midwest. It's a very low church Protestant church. Um, not a lot that you have to uh, promised to believe in the creed, uh, which was great because I didn't really know what I believed. I just sort of like this person, Jesus, uh, felt a lot of passion about what I had read and didn't have a very strong sense too much of what I believe beyond that. So it's a perfect place for me, and I found really wonderful people in this church. So I, I was actually double dipped. I was baptized again because in the d disciples tradition, you do that when you're an adult and you have consent. And so Technically, you're not really supposed to be baptized twice. You can't be baptized twice, but um, went through that ritual anyway um, as, a second, as a second time as an adult. I spent a while in Disciples Church, went on to graduate school, moved to Boston. No Disciples Churches out here in Boston that uh, we could find, and ended up going to a couple different Protestant denominations before I ended up in a really wonderful um, Presbyterian Protestant church downtown that I was very deeply involved in. So I'm going to tell you about the part about the Catholicism. And one thing I really want to emphasize is that when I was first interested in becoming Catholic, I wasn't really looking for anything different. I was really happy in the church that I was at. Uh, my husband and I were raising our, our daughter uh, and then later our son in this church. I taught Sunday school. Uh, I loved the community. It was a very tightly knit community, really wonderful people. Uh, a lot of kids in the community, very uh, diverse multiculturally in terms of the children's population, a lot of uh, adopted children, uh, uh, a lot of gay and lesbian parents, which I liked and appreciated, um, a lot of uh, commitment to social justice. So a number of people worked at homeless shelters for the uh, living. So there were a lot of people who were involved in the, in the church itself who were very passionate about social justice issues in a variety of ways. Um, I ended up being an elder. They used to call me the youngest elder on the council. And I uh, was really pretty happy. And then I went to a postdoc program where I was uh, really good friends with a Catholic who shared my office with me. And he said to me one day, Marina, hey, how, do you want to come to Mass? Because we happen to be teaching the Gospels in a core curriculum type of program, sort of similar to perspectives here that we had at BU. It was a BU postdoc. So I said, sure, I'll come. You know, I'm just sort of curious. I think I'd maybe been to one mass before that, which was my brother's wedding. And I was just totally preoccupied with whether I uh, liked his wife, whom I love and adore. But <laughs> I was not thinking at all about the mass. I was thinking about my brother getting married. So I really had no exposure to the Catholic um, ritual, I think, other than that. I, uh, and what I found was something very unexpected. I found myself going to mass on Fridays with him initially out of sense of curiosity, and finding myself incredibly and deeply drawn to this, uh, this uh, mass that was initially very unfamiliar and not something I had, again, grown up with or really been exposed to. Um, I had a very deep sense of longing. I had a very deep sense of love for the Eucharist. And uh, basically, it scared the hell out of me, you know, because I was very happy in the community that I was in. 
I wasn't looking for anything different, and I thought to myself, this really doesn't fit too much with my life. But I figured I'll give it a shot. I'll go to Mass. I used to go to Mass on Fridays, and then on Sundays I'd go to my Protestant church and do all the stuff that I did with them. Uh, and spent, I spent a while doing that. Eventually, I uh, started to really give it serious consideration. You know, should I become Catholic? I felt so drawn, not only by the uh, uh, Mass itself and the sacramental nature of the church, but also by the intellectual tradition, which I was learning more and more about while I was teaching this course at Boston University and having this friendship um, with a person who happened to be a St. Thomas of Aquinas scholar, which is very convenient because if you've ever met a Thomas, they have an answer for everything. So any question that you can ask them about a matter of faith, spirituality, relationship between reason and faith, you know, Aquinas wrote a lot of books. He pretty much tried to address it all. Uh, and so had very lively intellectual discussions with all the postdocs in my program there. Uh, what happened was I couldn't see how I would fit this new part of my life, though, in with the rest of my life. My husband, not Catholic. My kids, not being raised Catholic. My husband's family, not Catholic, which was really important for me because it was really their faith, Disciples of Christ, that um, was initially sort of the place I had found a, a place to express my desire to be part of this Christian community. So it wasn't simply that I thought, well, would my in-laws disapprove? Um, they're extremely supportive and loving, caring people. But rather, what would it mean to move away from this faith that I had really, uh, in some ways, found in part through them and through their uh, uh, introducing me to the to uh, the, the Church of Disciples? So I uh, also worried a lot about leaving behind the community of people that I was with, the community of people in that particular church. And so mostly out of a sense of fear that this wouldn't work with my family life and this wouldn't work with my desire to be part of a community, I just stopped going to Mass. I quit. I said I, f I felt absolutely full of longing to be part of the Catholic Church at this point, but I didn't feel that it would fit very well with most of my life. And this is where I want to say something about freedom, because um, it's an interesting point. I, I'm a big fan of St. Ignatius uh, of Loyola, founder of the Jesuits. Uh, if you spend very long talking to me about religion, I'll probably start talking about Ignatius. And one of the things Ignatius talks about is that uh, idea of freedom, that God is trying to draw each one of us to greater and greater freedom, freedom to be ourselves, and especially freedom to seek out whatever our deepest desire is. And I think one of the interesting things, at least in my experience, has been that we often think that, you know, uh, growing in faith um, can mean something like learning how to say no to bad things or learning how to, you know, turn away from things that are negative for us. But I think the hardest thing actually is saying yes to the things that we really, really want. Uh, faith is not so much about learning how to say no to the things that are bad for you. I think primarily the sort of struggle of faith for me has been learning how to say yes to the things that I really want and that are really good for me. And in uh, this particular case, that was true. I, I, I kind of knew what I wanted. I felt pretty sure God wanted this of me. And I couldn't figure out how it would fit. So I said, forget it. So I stopped going to Mass. I think for about five years, I didn't attend a Mass at all, you know, which is a really long time for me. If you know me, it's something that's uh, really uh, kind of important part of my personal life. And it, it was something that I just, I felt like I couldn't go and have the sort of longing to be part of the church if uh, it wasn't going to fit with my life. So I decided, forget it, I'm not going to go to Mass anymore. And, and the only way I can describe the experience was I kind of, for a couple of years, had this feeling that um, God was sort of like knocking at my door, you know, if you kind of imagine it, an interior door to me, that, that God was sort of knocking in a persistent and gentle way and saying, here's something that you might really want for yourself. Go ahead. And I was saying basically to the knock on the door, shut up, go away. Uh, a few years later, I started working at BC teaching perspectives. So I know a few of my perspective students are here tonight. Thank you for coming. Uh, and it was as I was teaching perspectives that I became drawn back into the question of conversion again. I was reading all this amazing stuff, I thought amazing stuff, about um, the relationship between faith and reason, a lot of intellectual questions. But I think the person who struck me the most was Augustine, because in the middle of Augustine's confessions, he talks about this experience where intellectually he knew he kind of wanted to convert to the faith. 
He uh, had a personal desire to do it, but he couldn't quite do it. So I'm reading this book about St. Augustine, you know, a couple thousand years ago practically, and here he is describing in Book 8 of the Confessions that I wanted more than anything to convert. I wanted to become part of this faith. I knew this is what I should do. I knew this is what I really believed. And then he says, I just couldn't do it. So I'm reading this book, teaching this in front of my students, not telling them, of course, hey, this is me. This is what I saw in this book. And Augustine was a kind of picture of myself. Um, and so it forced me uh, to kind of confront the question, again, of what did, did I personally really want? Where did God want me uh, individually to be, and, and what did I need to do about it? So I decided, as an intellectual working in a philosophy department, I said, well, what I'll do is I'll read through the Catholic Catechism. And then, like, if I really believe what the Catechism has to say, then, you know, that's a good sign that I should be a Catholic. And if I don't believe what the catechism has to say at some points, then maybe that's not right for me because I want to be a person of integrity, you know, intellectual integrity. So the catechism, I should have brought it, I have up in my office. Uh, it's about 600 pages, right? And it, it's not, I wouldn't say a real scintillating read for the most part. <laughs> um, you know, if you want to read a really exciting 600-page book, read Moby Dick or something. Um, but I was, I was interested in trying to read about the details of the faith in the hopes that this intellectual resolution of the problem would solve my kind of interior problem, uh, which I think was ultimately probably about you know, trusting in God and trusting my own desires and trusting my own wishes. So uh, I read through this catechism, and whenever I found a problem with some belief that I wasn't sure about, didn't understand, disagreed with, I'd put in these little stickies, you know, these little stickies that you can buy to, to you know, mark up passages and books. So I'd read like Limbo, you know, I don't know about Limbo, or um, St. Mary as a Protestant. You know, you talk about Mary basically on Christmas Eve, and that's it. I had no idea. It wasn't even that I was against the ideas. I just was totally unfamiliar with some of these. Uh, so I would put these stickies in. So pretty soon I have this 600-page book that's full of stickies. All right, so I, I'm like, all right, I'm just going to go through them, right? Kind of work on ta talking with people about the intellectual issues. So I start talking with colleagues and having debates. It was all great and interesting. Uh, meanwhile, I also decided probably it would be good to pray about this. So I had started to go back to Mass with a friend, uh, sometimes on Sunday nights down at St. Clement's Eucharistic Shrine downtown Boston, uh, far away from BC because I didn't want anyone to actually see that I was going to Mass because then they might ask me if I was Catholic and if not, maybe I was interested in being Catholic, and I didn't really want to have that um, discussion. I wasn't kind of ready to be very open about it with people. And again, I think it's just my, it was my sense of kind of fear or not seeing how this would fit in with the overall picture of my life. And I start to pray. I go to Mass. I'm praying. I have this, again, strong sense that this is maybe the right decision for me, um, but unable to kind of move to any kind of resolution or closure on it. Uh, there are times when I was in the church and I was crying, you know, because I felt so overwhelmed by a sort of sense of indecision and, again, the family and community pieces in particular. And, uh, and I had other moments of, of real joy and peace and happiness. So I, at one point I, I was praying to God and saying, look, just give me clarity. I just want to know, you know, what do you want me to do? I'll do it. And, and I had this great moment. I had this great moment where, I remember, I was kneeling like five or six pews from the front because converts always sit really close to the front, you know. Um, and, you know, we're going to see everything, not miss anything. So I, I'm, I'm praying there, and I, um, I had this moment that everything would be all right, really, like a sense of what Ignatius calls consolation, a sense of peace, rightness, everything kind of opening up. Uh, doors opening for me, a sense of freedom, as I was talking about. And so I think that was really the moment. If you have to name a moment where I became sure I was going to go ahead and convert, um, that was it. Uh, I was uh, planning anyway to go out with a friend of mine, actually Professor Kara Cronin, who gave another agape latte afterwards. Uh, and, uh, and I said to her, that's it, I'm going to convert. I'm all set. I'm going to do it. She said, great, yeah. That nice to hear it, you know. Uh, we had a little chat, and I went back to my office on Monday morning, and uh, there's a stupid catechism sitting on my desk, right? So again, I want to be a person of intellectual integrity. I mean, I believed in the creed and, you know, the kind of very basic things, but I still had all these questions about various issues, uh, and, I, and I wasn't settled on everything by any means intellectually. 
So I decide what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to a really conservative colleague uh, who's a priest um, and, uh, and take the question to him. So I take the catechism in my office, I pick it up off my desk, you know, open the door to my office, go down the hall, find my colleague's office. He knows a little bit about my situation at this point. Uh, unfortunately, his door is open. Of course, I'm thinking, I wish it weren't open, then I wouldn't have to think about this anymore. I walk into his office, I put the catechism down on the desk, and I say to him, is it okay if I convert with all the stickies? And he said, well, sure. That's all he said, was well, sure. And I, it was the first time that it occurred to me it could be that simple, you know, because I love to over-intellectualize about things. I overthink things. I like to make sure everything's right, you know. I like to analyze things. That's what I'm, what I'm paid to do for a living <laughs> to some extent. And, uh, but, but the answer was really a very simple one, you know. I had come to see what my deepest desire was. I knew what I really loved. I knew I really wanted this. And uh, it was really a question of having trust, you know, setting aside my fears and having the trust to believe, in a sense, in myself and to believe in what I um, was, was really wanting for myself. And so pretty quickly, I, I went ahead and, uh, and made the arrangements. And uh, I didn't even wait till Easter, because at this point, it had been like seven years. I was like, I went into this uh, parish. Of course, St. Clement's isn't a parish, right? So I'd go to Father Peter out of St. Clement's, and i say, I really want to convert. Because you'd think, you know, like numbers are down, they might <laughs> want to take somebody right away. So, uh, you know, Father Peter says, I, I can't, because I'm not a parish. You know, this is not a parish. We can't do that. So you have to go find a parish. So I go to West Roxbury, I basically walk in off the street, I've gone to maybe two masses there ever, and I meet with the pastor there, and I say to him and the um, head of Christian education, I really want to convert, and by the way, I want to do it like in two weeks, I hope that's okay with you. Uh, and, and they essentially said yes, because they had known some of the people I had been talking to at BC, and, and felt like, okay, you can skip our CIA if you've been, been working with these people. So that, that was really helpful, I wasn't really excited about um, waiting till the Easter time. So I, in December, I uh, went ahead and had my first confession. Of course, I thought I was going to be in there for hours because, you know, I'm an adult. I'm in my 30s at this point, and I had no idea what my first confession would be like. So I'm totally nervous beforehand and absolutely convinced, like, the priest should cancel all of his plans for the entire afternoon because I have a lot of things to say about my life. Uh, and, uh, of course, it turned out to be a really wonderful and very freeing experience. I, uh, and then I had my first um, uh, communion and, uh, and uh, what do you call it, confirmation. Uh, and in fact, my children also, uh, my daughter also had her uh, first communion and, and my uh, uh, husband had agreed that our kids could be raised Catholic after considerable discussion and back and forth about that. So uh, that would be uh, sort of the, in a way, the kind of nutshell picture of, you know, what's the kind of formal sense of conversion. Um, now. Tim had said to me, Raina, you got to say something, like, you're a philosopher, you work in the philosophy department, you got to say something kind of intellectual about your conversion. And so I immediately panicked because in some ways I don't really think about my story, particularly from an intellectual point of view. I really do think about it in terms of um, what, do, what do I want? And, and I can, in fact, if, you know, I look back at my life, I can think about a lot of ways in which the particular ways in which Catholicism attracts me have a lot to do with me, my childhood, uh, my parents, uh, the community that I was raised in, all kinds of things that are very, very particular to me as a human being. Uh, however, I decided um, this is a church in the 21st century talk, and it probably would be good to say something that sounds at least vaguely intellectual. So um, it's not Hegel <laughs> by any means. I was at a retreat with uh, Father Julio this past January, and one of the retreatants came up with a really neat thing that she said she uses to talk about what Catholicism is to people who are asking about it. Um, Technically, it was a silent retreat, but I kind of call it a silent for an Italian retreat uh, because Father Giulio had us meeting for, uh, we were talking at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and we also talked twice uh, a day at group meetings. So it was a wonderful retreat, Father Giulio, but um, it, was, we, it was a lot of discussion. And one of the wonderful things I learned at this discussion um, uh, over lunch was a woman who said she thinks about Catholicism as like having five fingers on a hand. Like every finger stands for a different element of what she sees as important to Catholicism. So this is totally ripped off from somebody else. Um, the thumb, she said, is like the sacraments in the church. 
because the same way that our thumb sets us apart from other animals, the thumb is what kind of sets apart to some extent, actually not technically true for every sacrament, but you know, there's a distinctive set of seven sacraments that uh, belong to the Catholic Church and Orthodox and Episcopalians and others like that. Uh, so the sacraments are the thumb. The pointer finger, she said, is like the scripture because it points us in the way that we want to go, that Jesus or the Gospels point us in the direction that we ought to be living. Then my favorite, and perhaps yours, is the middle finger. <laughs> she said the middle finger is like social justice because it's like giving, finger to the giving the finger to the world's values, right? that there's values in the world and that part of social justice is challenging those values. So um, I'm not gonna demonstrate on camera, but hi mom, you know, so I, I uh, and so that's social justice piece of, of the church. Um, it's helpful to use your left hand to do this because the ring finger can be seen as community, right? So you wear a wedding ring, I have a wedding ring, an engagement ring on this, um, but also community in the larger sense, beyond our individual families, but a larger sense of community is part of the church. And then she said that prayer is like the last pinky finger because it's so important, but it always gets the short end of the stick in any discussion. So I want to say very briefly, uh, because I, I know a lot of this is supposed to be back and forth discussion, just something about each of these five fingers on uh, the hand of Catholicism and how it's been important for me uh, personally. Um, first is sac sacraments. I think for me, the, um, one of the most important things about being Catholic was, again, being able to receive the sacraments. Uh, it's been very freeing for me to be able to participate in them, particularly after having had the sense of having to wait for so many years. Um, but I think in a much deeper sense, I, my, my sense of, of being Catholic is that uh, the Catholic faith is deeply incarnational in its worldview. In other words, uh, this idea of the incarnation, that God became a human being, right, that he took on human flesh and was just really ordinary and more or less looked like you and me, um, I think is, is lived out in so many ways in the Catholic faith. Uh, so look at just the sacraments themselves, right? Bread and wine are these really basic human foods that are part of this sacrament by which we are able to participate in the body and blood of Christ. I think that's a really amazing thing to, to ponder, that something very simple like bread is so central to that sacrament. Or think about the sacrament of uh, confession. Um, the priests who offer confession are just ordinary people. I mean, they're priests, right? And so they, they can offer the sacrament. But in another sense, they're just as flawed and sinful and imperfect as you and I are. And so there's a sense in which this incredibly holy thing can happen through a person who's just more or less like us, right? Very, a very ordinary kind of thing. Or the sacrament of marriage. Um, you know, marriage is always about two really imperfect people trying to, trying to work it out. You know, I've been married now for, I can't remember exactly, 16, 17 years, I guess, and uh, for a really long time. And, you know, certainly my experience is not that it's every moment's holiness or anything like that. Um, it's actually, it's a very difficult kind of thing, I think, to be married for a long time. But there's a kind of holiness in, in the imperfection in a way that's a little hard for me to articulate, but I can try to talk about it more later if you want. Um, there's a kind of holiness in the imperfection of two people coming together and kind of having that fidelity to each other despite everything. I think also there's a kind of deeper sense of sacramentality in the church just in how the whole world can be kind of become a kind of sign of God's grace. So technically, right, a sacrament is supposed to be an outward sign of an inward grace. But in a larger sense, you know, when, um, when I moved into our new house in West Roxbury new three or four years ago, we found buried in the front lawn a glow-in-the-dark, upside-down St. Joseph statue. And I had no idea what this was or why it was in there. Um, I figured, like, if I dropped it, moving out of the house or something. And I guess there's this tradition in New England or maybe just in Boston that if you want to sell your house, you can bury a, I don't know if it has to be glow-in-the-dark, a statue of St. Joseph in your lawn, and that'll help you sell your home. I love that kind of thing. I, I think it's great. I, I think, and I really take it seriously. I mean, it's, it's funny to say that I love, which I do, going through West Roxbury in uh, Christmas time and seeing, like, the glow-in-the-dark holy family on the lawn, you know? Like, I love the fact that West Roxbury has that kind of... Um, sense of that the really, really ordinary, like the kitsch can be holy, you know? I, I think there's something really serious, and I'm not joking about this, that there's something deeply sacramental in a worldview that can 
uh, embody a glow-in-the-dark statue with that kind of power. And, and I think it has to do, again, with this view of the incarnation, that the world is just a really holy place and not just, you know, pristine, perfect, beautiful things, not just beautiful sunsets or, you know, love at its prime, but really, really ordinary things have an incredible sense of holiness to them. And certainly the Jesuits, when they talk about finding God in all things, I think really emphasize that. So sacraments. Uh, second thing that I think has been a source of appreciation, I, I've had a sense of appreciation, appreciation for, is the uh, way in which the Catholic tradition has continued to look at the Gospels and kind of what they mean in terms of contemporary life. The um, church, of course, is a developmental church, right? You've probably heard this before, maybe even um, in Father Keenan's talk when he talked uh, and gave the talk last time for Agape Latte that the church's understanding of the truth is always unfolding and developing. It's not, it's not the case that we say way back when the disciples were alive and they were living next to Jesus, they got Jesus right, and now we have to go back to exactly what they said and figure it out for ourselves and um, you know, listen to what they said. Most of the disciples got it really wrong, right? So if you think about the scenes where Jesus is... Um, you know, the disciples are near Jesus, and they say things like, well, keep the kids away, right? There's this crowd of little children trying to come near him, and the disciples are all saying, oh, those kids are going to bug him. You know, it's, he's very busy. He's a busy guy. He's healing and everything. Keep the children away. And, you know, Jesus is saying, let the little children come to me. And I always get the sense that he was, you know, kind of sighing a lot around the disciples, a little bit exasperated maybe. And, and, and you know, I think that's probably true for most of us today too. We're not getting... Jesus right for the most part. Um, but at the same time, there's a way in which the Catholic tradition attempts to keep trying anyway. You know, we keep trying as a tradition to continue to engage the really tough questions, um, not just, you know, questions like bringing children to Jesus, but also things like uh, something like Rerum Navarum, which we read in Perspectives, um, a papal encyclical that talks about what's the just way to treat workers in an industrialized world. Or today, we might think about globalization and sweatshops. You know, those aren't questions that came up in the church of the first century, and yet they're really fundamental questions for us to think about today. And so for me, I have really appreciated the way in which the Catholic faith is not fundamentalist, is not oriented towards a particular time, but to say that in a very important way, Jesus continues to point the way in our world to what we need to do. Uh, a third uh, idea of social justice, again, idea of uh, bringing the finger to the world, right? So I, um, I, one of the struggles I had in joining the Catholic Church was, for example, that I had a lot of gay and lesbian friends. And, uh, you know, I'm, like, really fun at a party because I'm pro-life. I also have gay and lesbian friends, so I don't kind of fit the um, maybe conventional conservative liberal standards in some ways. And one of the things that was really hard for me was having friends um, – who I think often felt very marginalized by the church. Um, I think one thing that was helpful for me was looking at the overall social justice teachings of the church and seeing that you know there's a sense that the human being is sacred no matter what, the sense that the human being is social, that we need one another, and the sense that the marginalized is who God is always coming to, that Jesus is always seeking out the people who are marginalized. And so uh, not that that solved my struggles, not that that's answered all the questions for me, but I think that sense that the church has a very deep commitment to the idea that Jesus comes to those who are excluded and tries to bring them into community, bring them back towards uh, loving relationships with others in a very deep way is, has been uh, very helpful. Um, and then real quickly in the last two, because I know we won't have time for discussion, uh, is the uh, sense of community. Sometimes I think people can have the experience, and um, unfortunately not everybody is helpful in uh, communicating the experience, uh, but the, the sense that maybe the Catholic Church can be very exclusive, exclusive or exclusionary, right? The sense that um, maybe when you join the Catholic faith, what you're doing is joining people who are sort of limiting themselves to a particular community. I mean, my own experience has really been the opposite of that. Um, I don't mean to delegitimize other people who've had that experience of being excluded. I think I've talked to enough people that they, they have had that experience, and, uh, and I think that's really unfortunate. Um, for me, the sense was that instead of just joining this particular group of 200 or 300 people in a, in a Protestant church, but I was joining Catholicism. You know, So my kids, when a uh, few weeks or maybe months after we had joined the church, we were on vacation, 
and we went into another Catholic church, and my kids are whispering to me going, Mom, I don't know if we can go up, you know, for communion because this isn't our church. And I said to them, well, well, you can actually. You can go to any Catholic church you want, and you can participate in communion. And you don't have to explain to them. You don't have to give an account of who you are. You know, you, you just go. Uh, and that's been very important for me, the sense that the church is really a worldwide church. It's universal. It's not just Americans. It's not conservatives. It's not liberals. Um, it's, not, it's not any of those kinds of labels, that it really is a universal church for everyone, um, or uh, potentially so. The other thing um, I guess that's been important for me is this idea of the community of saints, that the community that we're part of as Catholics is a community of living people and dead people, the people who aren't alive anymore are still part of that community. Uh, and I have good friends, you know, who've, who've lost people um, who still, uh, and, and certainly I do too, think about the, the Mass um, as a place where we're still in communion with people who, who aren't alive, but they're still part of our community. You know, they haven't left that sense of community. So that's been a very widening, again, freeing sense of community growing. Uh, and then I think also important for me has been the sense that the uh, church is a place, a community of broken people that uh, we're all broken people, you know, and that uh, certainly a part of my own uh, growth and hopeful, hopefully moving more towards freedom has been acknowledging like my own brokenness as a person, not just being sinful, but the ways in which I've experienced sin at the hands of other people as well, and that we're all kind of united by being broken. I think that's something that's communicated very effectively um, in the life of the church in, in a number of different ways, and that's been very significant for me personally. Lastly, prayer. Um, I could talk about prayer for an hour, but I won't. Um, but I, I, I love St. Ignatius, and so almost everything I know about uh, prayer probably comes in some way, not everything, but an awful lot of what's important to me comes from the Jesuits. It's a huge gift to me that um, I've learned about St. Ignatius on prayer. And I think the most important thing is the sense that God really wants to communicate directly with us. Again, um, for Ignatius, the idea is that we should be growing in freedom. And so he has these various ways of praying, like using your imagination to um, be part of a gospel story, to uh, engage in really you know, imagining all the senses, the experiences that you might see if you're in the nativity scene itself. Um, that there's a way in which God can literally continue to communicate himself to us. So he says, and uh, Ignatius says in the spiritual exercises, that the uh, creator wants to deal with the creature directly. So again, the sense that God wants to speak to all of us, not just, you know, 2,000 years ago, earlier in history, but he's constantly trying to speak to us. And I think my sense of prayer um, over a relatively short period of time, it's very much still growing, um, but has been that prayer isn't even just about those formal senses of prayer. The prayer is really anywhere in life that we can find God communicating himself to us. So it can be in a moment of appreciating nature, it can be in a moment of formal prayer, it can be in an encounter with another person that I can see as a sign of God in my ordinary interaction with him or her. Uh, and so prayer itself can, can be a way of, of coming to know God more closely. So to wrap up, I just want to give one little comment, which is I was telling my kids, my husband, about this talk a couple weeks ago when I was preparing it, maybe a week ago, and uh, was doing the five fingers, so I won't tell you what I said to my son about the middle finger, but... Uh, and as I was giving this talk, I said uh, to him, here are the five fingers, and he said, Mom, what about the palm? And I said, oh, that's easy. That's Jesus. Jesus is the palm. So I really like Jesus. So I, uh, I love Jesus. I don't want to mock it even. I, uh, and I, I really do. And I, I think, uh, and I think that for me that's really the key thing. Like you can talk intellectually about the nature of the sacraments. You can talk intellectually about uh, the community tradition, and it's important, I think, to do that. I think I don't want to underestimate the importance of having discussions. We need to communicate with each other, use language, use words. But at the same time, for me, the most important thing about all of these five things is that this is a way of experiencing Jesus. It's not simply uh, an intellectual apparatus that stands alone, but that we do through the sacraments, we do through prayer, we do through community, and we're not through one another, we do through social justice, we do through the Gospels continue to know God in a, in a very direct way. And I think uh, that's what it's all about. So I would be happy to take your questions if you have any. And you can ask whatever you feel like. I'm very, like, my students know this from class. Like, I will talk about myself endlessly if given the opportunity. So, yes. 
Um, yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, you mean my uh, parents and, yes, my in-laws. So I don't think I told my parents or my in-laws that I was going to be Catholic until I had decided. Yeah, I don't think I did. And I, um, I think, that, I mean, they were incredibly understanding. I think they were a little shocked because I hadn't talked about it very much. Um, in general, that's partly my personality. I tend to think things through and talk things over with a few key people in my life, uh, you know, four, five, six people, whatever, but, and then and not say anything to, to everybody else. And with my in-laws, I just didn't feel I'd have confidence that they would be okay with this. Um, they've been really welcoming and accepting of it. I think they were really initially shocked and taken aback, um, but not critical. I think just surprised, you know, just didn't see this coming. And, um, but they've been extremely supportive. Yeah. <laughs> Do I still have the stickies? No, I don't have the stickies in the catechism. I took them out. Um, yeah, I was telling the story to the, um, I was, I told the story at halftime at a retreat and, uh, the briefer version of it and, uh, was recounting this with that priest friend of mine and he was saying, yeah, I think you had them color coded, you know, <laughs> so I don't know if that's true. I hope not, but it's, it's entirely plausible. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a really great question. I really appreciate it. Um, I mean, so it, the funny thing was, initially when I made the uh, switch, it's only been a few years, I I so wanted to distinguish from myself the change that the, many of the things that I had done when I was, say, an elder, like helping to serve at communion, I actually didn't want to do right away. It was almost like for me it was really important to make a kind of uh, a break or something. I just like from a psychological standpoint. So initially, I don't think I felt any of that kind of concern. I just wanted to kind of be in this place that I've been looking for for a long time and kind of just receive and enjoy it and not really think through those things so much. Um, I think I am thinking through some of those things more now. Um, I my own experience at BC has been like in terms of the things I want to do to be able to talk about questions of tradition or um, uh, be part of an intellectual community. I feel very welcome to do that at BC. I certainly don't feel excluded as a woman. Um, I, you know, I'm not a religious, so for me, the question of priesthood or something like that isn't like immediately relevant. Um, I work now teaching CCD in my Sunday school, and I, I guess I felt uh, a lot of being welcomed as a woman, as a layperson. Um, but I, I do uh, think a lot about those issues of why you know women aren't more involved particularly in like leadership of decisions like at the Vatican I think you know there are not a lot of women in the curia for example so even if you're not talking about the question of the priesthood per se there's still a lot of room for greater involvement of women um, at various levels of the church yes Right, so this is the weirdest thing because my experience has been that most of my Catholic friends aren't that into Jesus. Like they think I'm very funny for being to Jesus and, and not in a mean way, but like I think it's not really part of their experience. There are a few friends of mine who are and that's really important to me to have those friends. But I, um, strangely enough for me, I've become much more Jesus-centered as a Catholic than I ever was as a Protestant. I think part of that is having belonged to a kind of low church liberal Protestant tradition, which emphasized a lot more like the historical Jesus and kind of historical critical method, even at the level of like sermons and things like that. Um, and I think for me, uh, coming to be close to Jesus uh, to the extent that I am is something that I found more through prayer. And especially when um, I started going to spiritual direction, doing Ignatian uh, influence prayers, like in the spiritual exercises, that that was really where uh, Jesus became important for me. Not that he wasn't before, he was, even when I read the Gospels. But I think the fullness of that um, began to happen more, not that I reached the fullness of it, but you know, that, that, that has become really personally significant to me since being a Catholic as opposed to before.
But I think, you know, most people, if you talk to Protestants versus Catholics, most Protestants are much more Jesus-centered than most Catholics. I think I'm just like an anomaly in that way. Other questions? Right, so on the gay lesbian issue. So I um, I guess the first thing I would say is I haven't reconciled it. Like I think, um, and I think for me that's part of the, the story about the stickies is about, for me, um, besides being an amusing accountant, being a philosopher, whatever, is is that um, that's part of faith. Like for me, part of for, faith is struggle with those things. Like I don't think, uh, maybe someone could have an authentic faith where they never struggle with anything, but I don't think so. And it might not be in this issue. It might be something else. You know, it might be a struggle with themselves. It might it may not even be a doctrinal thing. But um, I think, for me at least, part of faith is being actively in involved in that struggle. And for me, struggle means two things. It means not um, discounting my own uh, experience of having friends who I think, uh, I, I know particularly uh, lesbian families who've like raised and adopted children together, who have been close friends of mine for years, and I see their relationship as grace. I can't deny that my firsthand experience of who they are as people is, in a, is a graced family. At the same time, I really take seriously the church's teaching that sexuality, you know, is, I think the church's teaching of sexuality is overall a very beautiful teaching. I'm not going to be the kind of person who's going to say, let's get rid of the family, or that um, procreation isn't this absolutely amazing thing, or that the exchange of love between a man and a woman having children isn't this astonishing thing. I think it's amazing. It's one of the holiest things there is. So um, for me, it's been less about come in to change the church or alternatively saying I'm going to push down all my feelings or push down all my own experience and, and ignore it and decide that it's wrong. Um, it's been more about trying to be involved in a conversation and, and sort of feeling like I want uh, part of my faith is being part of a conversation with people where I seriously try to listen. I have conservative friends who are nowhere near me on this issue and I'm friends with them and I and I want to have open and honest and back and forth discussions with them about it because I think that is part of being in community in a church is to have that kind of honesty and exchange that is not um, just trying to change the other person's mind without any thought. So, so that's where I'm at. Yes. Yeah, I guess I think that. Um, it depends. Like, I think some of the issues in the catechism were, think, like, for example, the question of Mary. I think for me, that was, I love Mary now. When I first uh, became Catholic, I just was unfamiliar with thinking about her as, I don't, I think I had, I didn't have a strong sense of the tradition of the saints or anything like that. I mean, for me, it, she's actually a fairly important figure um, and, and person to me. Uh, so in that case, I think I've learned a lot through just time and experience to, and I'm, again, completely ignorant of all these things compared to cradle Catholics. Of everything I've talked about, cradle Catholics know, know 10 times more than I do. Um, but I, I uh, in some cases I have, and I think, for example, on the issue of, of gays and lesbians is something I just, I do struggle with all the time. So I, I don't have a uniform answer to that question. Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. So, um, right. I think that's a really good point and a good insight into me, probably. Um, yeah, uh, that idea that passion led and then reason followed. I, I think, yeah, I think a lot of my, um, first of all, I think I am different than a lot of philosophers in and uh, I've brought this up in my classes, I tend not to see reason and emotion as separate that much. So a lot of philosophers will separate them in a very formal sense. So like someone like Kant, right, makes this absolute distinction between reason, which tells us what's good, 
and then emotion, which is just like the most untrustworthy thing in the world. Um, and I tend to think that they're not really separable to begin with. Um, so that's sort of a philosophical point about that, um, which is maybe a rational account of it. But I think, yeah, that's right. I think that for me, um, it's not that you know impulsive or passing emotions are good guides. Um, I do sometimes act impulsively, and that's never a good choice. But when uh, this, I think Ignatius' sense of consolation, desolation, you know, he talks about those as, as leading people. When he talks about consolation, he talks about the sense of, again, rightness, joy, peace, freedom, doors being opened up. And I think another thing he emphasizes is repetition over time. So it's not just, and it's not really about the one-time experience. It's the over time, many experiences of something leading you to a deeper and deeper sense of joy. But yeah, I think ultimately I probably do value that more than um, a picture of reason that is disconnected from affect or disconnected from, from emotion. But I think, I think they're not really separate. I think they're together all the time. Yes. Yeah, that's a great, good question. Um, I mean, I think the thing about, so here's the thing about different religions. I guess on the one hand, I think that God works, that God's grace is so abounding that it, it has to work in all kinds of different places. It can't work in any particular place. But at the same time, I, I do have the stance that, you know, in my own personal experience, my own, you know, way of, of looking at these things that, it's in the Catholic faith that I found these things that I talked about, these five things, that have really been ways of experiencing that um, in the way that has been richest of all the other ways I've tried. So for me, it's both, yes, I really believe that this is the place where for me that's, this takes place. And I, and I take it seriously as the sacraments really are the presence of Jesus um, and that the church really is a place where people try to move towards greater intellectual freedom and things like that. I, I really mean it. And I'm committed to it. At the same time, I'm also really committed to the idea that there is a sense in which all religions are um, ways in which people come to know God. And I have really high respect for, for other faiths. So I, in terms of the question of whether I wish it were different, I mean, I must know what to say about that because I think religion is defined so much by those kinds of rituals, you know, I mean, in, in sense of community and what you, you call um, sacramental, that uh, I mean, there's a way in which we're human beings, right? So we need to have like these ways of externalizing our internal experience. You can have all the internal experiences you want of prayer or feelings or affect or emotion or whatever, but at the end of the day, we're social. So we have to do these things together. You know, we have to find ways of articulating or expressing these experiences in ways that are, you know, communal and that make sense and that can kind of uh, bind us together, I guess. So I, I don't know. I mean, certainly I, I don't, I, ha I personally did not find adequate growing up for myself a kind of diffuse sense of spirituality where, you know, you might not have very many differences between various denominations or various faiths, but you have a lot shared, but there's not a lot of content in terms of the day-to-day -day action or way in which that's lived out. Uh, relationship with the other church, yeah. So I have, um, it's interesting, one of the, um, I haven't gone back there for services, I have to say, and part of it is that around the same time that I joined the Catholic Church, there were a lot of changes in terms of the ministry at the Presbyterian Church, and so many of the friends that we um, had in that congregation originally no longer even go to that church anymore, they go other places. So um, if we were to go back, we probably we would find that a lot of the people there are different, and all the ministers are different, and all the people who did Christian education are different. Uh, a lot of turnover in the church in the past few years. 
Um, I did actually just run into here at BC a woman who um, is, uh, was a member of uh, the church. And it was interesting because she was one of the first people that I had told of my interest in Catholicism within my, that Protestant church. I had, her husband's Catholic, and so we used to go to these retreats down in Craigville together. We'd carpool, and I'd always sort of bring up, yeah, you know, I kind of like Catholicism. There's something really interesting about that in these very vague ways. And she, uh, she's always extremely supportive and uh, understanding and open. Uh, whereas I, I think um, that, uh, yeah, I think, I think that I, I wasn't particularly open probably with a lot of other people there as I was going through that. And again, that's partly my personality, not to talk about things that I'm, as I'm undergoing them um, with too many people. Coming with a cane. Oh. Thanks. Thank you, Marina. Uh, please join me in thanking our speaker.